Where do we find joy? If you ask that question of best-selling poet and essayist Ross Gay, don't expect a short answer. Gay's new book of essays, Inciting Joy, is a lyrical quest to identify, or you could say define, joy. Gay says that true joy manifests from connections with others. He sees incitements to joy in the ways we tend to each other in what he calls radical collaborations. Sharing seeds for a garden, playing pickup basketball, or experiencing deep grief at the death of someone we love. Ross Gay, thanks so much for being here today to talk about your new book, Inciting Joy. Thank you. I'm glad to be with you. I have, I have to say it's not very interviewish or journalistic, but I absolutely love this book. Oh, cool. Thank you. <laughs> I really Thank love you. this book yeah. in so many ways. And you talk about the different incitements, is what you call them, to joy in your life and, and sometimes more broadly. Why write about joy and why write about it now? You know, I feel like... Um, and I talk about this in the introduction. One, there was a kind of provocation because over the last handful of years, I had been, because I have a book called Catalog of Unabashed Gratitude, and then I have a book called The Book of Delights. Like, I've been in a lot of these conversations about joy. And among the things that people have asked um, over the years is something like, how can we talk about joy at a time like yeah. this? First of all, I'm always like, what's not a time like this? Second of all, um, and maybe more to the point, I'm like, oh, yeah, but that's a, that's a different understanding of joy than I have. And that understanding of joy is, is something more like, you know, ch chipperness or something, you know? But when I'm talking about joy, I'm talking about, I think I say it like this in the book, but something like the light that emanates from us when we help each other carry our sorrows. You know, none of us is without heartbreak. None of us is without sorrow. So that's to say it's always, it's always a consideration. It's always a time like this. The other thing is that, you know, actually I'm sort of just curious how we, um, how we're going to be in the midst of like the many collapses um, that, we're, that we're in. And, you know, always somewhere, some kind of collapse going on, but I'm curious about these new ones and how, I'm curious to witness how we're going to, what we'll do in them. You know, a key part of what you seem to talk about in your book a lot is connectivity and the role of that in having joy in our lives with joy being something more complex, as you say, than just happiness and light. Yeah, and, and that's the thing, it's funny, because I just had a conversation at one of these, I'm on a book tour, and so I've been having all these great conversations. And one of the fun things to me about the book tour or giving readings is that in the conversations, I learn a lot more about what I'm trying to, you know, these books are like questions. And so people get to sort of ask questions of the questions, and we get to sort of get more lost together. But the in, in the, one of the lines, I think in Harrisburg, someone said it, and it seems like I should know this. It seems like I probably wrote it, but it just like struck me so clearly, which is that joy is, it seems to me, always the, a, a condition that emanates from our being aware at a moment that we're connected to something bigger than ourselves, which is why some, something like getting a new watch probably is not like a, a joy. It might be totally useful, necessary, great, happy, whatever. But joy is something like where you are, you know, I think, and again, like I'm not, I'm not like an expert and I'm just like curious about this, but it's more something like a kind of submission or joining, it's a joining. Um, and that, that connectedness, you know, it feels really vital at all times, but it feels particularly vital maybe at a time when our alienation from one another and from the earth, you know, is so profound. It's so acute, you know. You walk in any classroom and 80% of the kids are gonna be on their phones, you know. And when you walk into a classroom and the kids are like talking to each other, it feels like, oh my God, what a, <laughs> what a gift, that old thing, conversation. So yeah, connection. Connection, yeah. yeah. One of the things you talk about may seem counterintuitive, but about grief and about your father's death. Yeah. Can you tell us why grief, how grief can possibly initiate joy? Well, yeah, the, the, again, like what I, the way that I think about it is that joy does not, em, does not exist absent sorrow. It doesn't, like, that's, that's some other emotion, and I don't know what it is, and, I'm, and I like it, whatever. 
but we don't get out of sorrow. So that's the sort of thing. And and my understanding, and again, I'm sort of following like plenty of other writers and thinkers, one of whom is Zadie Smith, and she has a great essay called Joy. And, and she says in there something, this is a very different take than I do, but the take that, that we share, and I kind of learned from her, is that joy doesn't exist without the intolerable. Which again, in various ways, like we're going to experience, or maybe we're in the midst of experiencing, you know, very possibly. I'm trying to prepare the ground for the, for the discussion here. And the ground is that, um, one is that we die. And that might, I'm, I'm I say something like this in the book, that might be the most interesting thing about us, you know? And two is that the way that we regard one another when we know we will die, or when we know we're in the process of dying, which we are, you know, but sometimes more acutely, um, th- those potential, those seem to me to be the also the ground for like the caring, the reaching across, the tending to one another that might be this thing that I'm thinking about called joy. You know, there's a beautiful um, teacher, Buddhist teacher, who I realized that so much of this thinking comes from, and Chongyam Trungpa Rinpoche, and I forget the title of the book. It might be the the Way of the Spiritual Warrior, maybe. Um, but I was going back through it and reading all the stuff that I had underlined. And I'd, I'd gone to his work back in, in my 20s a lot and early 30s. And um, he says something like, you know, the objective is to be um, smiling with tears in your eyes. And I, 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 I kind of agree. I kind of agree. Because what you're talking about is a deeper joy. It's not it, even you, you. You mentioned also, I think also early on in the book about you know this isn't about your new car giving you joy and yeah. you know this the watch you just bought or yeah. whatever example yeah. you want. The kind of joy we are kind of you know hear about or are, are bombarded with as a society. This is something deeper. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And that that thing too. That's important too. That we're bombarded by it as a society a largely consumerist society that has to sort of imagine that you can buy things to fix what you do not have. Um, which is important, you know, it's sort of like, it's just like so obvious and petty in a certain kind of way even to say it, but it's true. There's so many probably commercials and encouragements to go get your joy by purchasing something. When in fact, I kind of think, and I think this is what, why joy, well, among the reasons joy is a kind of incitement, is that um, that real feeling of joy might make our inclination, it, it will not make us go want to go buy stuff. It will make us want to share stuff, <laughs> you know? And that to me feels like uh, an incitement, you know? Well, this is, yeah, this is a book by a poet and an essayist. This is not, you know, this is not a how-to book on how to be joyful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, totally. Thank you. (laughs) By any means. And I'm really fascinated by how you get from point A to point B to point C. Like the pickup basketball chapter, I really loved. Oh, good. But that's also connectivity, right? Yeah. That's connecting with people on, on that level. But you go from a book that you liked, pick up basketball games, to a murmuration, yeah. you know, this yeah, yeah. pattern of birds in the sky, finally back to joy. Can you tell us a little bit about that process, how you get all those things in there? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you like that essay. I, I like that essay in part because it just flies yeah. around. But it starts with, it's kind of a long, rambunctious reading of um, this part of an essay by the writer John Edgar Wideman, who's one of my favorite writers in the world. And um, I start off talking about this moment in the book. Um, and then it veers off, and I'm talking about like a trip with my, a, a biking trip with my brother and, and my niece. And then we get back to the, and then there's this kind of meditation on property. And then we get to the basketball court and pick up basketball court, not the, not the, not the court with refs and stuff, but the pickup court. And it, it meditates hard. It does a kind of like very close reading of what happens on a pickup basketball court. Like what are all the sort of, I don't want to call them rules. I want to call them like practices inside of a pickup basketball court that, that are um, in a way models or they're like embedded structures for how we care for one another, you know. Um, they're embedded structures of how we keep this thing of us being able to hang out together yeah. going. And some of those structures, I'm just going to say it because not everyone catches this or knows it, even people who know basketball, 
you know, it's like everyone who plays pickup basketball will be a guest at some point. You have to ask to be let in the game. Everyone will be a host. You'll be looking for people to get on your team, you know. Everyone will, um, we will play each other at one point, and we might not like each other. Three games later, we very well might be on the same team, and we might play really good together. There's a there's a, a kind of a rule or something in pickup basketball that you call the next game. Like there's a game going on, you call the next game. You can call the next game. You can't call the next five games. You can call one game. You know, there's all of these rules mm-hmm. built into the game um, that that are reason perfectly reasonable, um, and they are. And also, and maybe the most important thing is that every time the group shifts on the court, the rules shift with them. You know, with us, and it's it's um, it's a kind of um, it's a kind of social life that doesn't need authority. It's the social life that is itself figuring out how we're going to be together. You know, and um, when I say that, I hear a, a, a beloved writer named Fred Moten, um, who matters a lot to this book, and he says. And this is about reading poems together, but he says we need to get together to figure out how to get together. <laughs> and pick up basketball is that as good as anything I know, you know. I mean, gardening is too, and skateboarding and all this other stuff that I talk about, yeah. but pick up basketball is really good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I like the gardening one too. Yeah. I mean, I like it, but the gardening chapter stuck with me, gardening essay. Um, I'm about to get my seed catalogs going and oh, yeah. look for those sunflower seeds. That yeah. was just the most vivid image to me mm. of the, the sunflowers that you kind of threw in a trench and yeah. didn't have a lot of hope for yeah. that came up and now uh, pretty soon we're taller than you. Totally, totally. And they just, they keep replanting themselves and the and the goldfinches keep replanting them. It's funny, I haven't planted uh, sunflowers for like three or four years now and it's all <laughs> <laughs> you still have them? Oh, yeah, they, they come every year. They come every year. Yeah. You almost pulled out the little shoots when yeah. you first saw them, thought they were nothing. <laughs> I know. It's so magic, like the transformation, but also the collaboration. Mm-hmm. And that's part of the thing about the garden um, that overlaps with, like, the pickup court and stuff, is that there's a there's a kind of radical collaboration going on that you may not ever pay attention to. But, and, but once you pay attention to it and you realize, oh, I'm a part of this radical collaboration that might be the goldfinches spitting the seeds it might be the the bees pollinating the the you know the the flowers it might be the all the other pollinators as well it might be the deer choosing to munch on something else you know like all of these in in addition to what all's going on under the ground it's such a kind of opportunity to again to recognize you belong to something beyond comprehension you know and benevolent and, and really benevolent you know it's kind of lucky well, I'm speaking you, to you here the day before the midterms, you know, and I, you talked a little bit about the sort of, I guess, just feeling in the air, I guess, I was how I would say it, you know, of the world being a little, a lot more divided. We don't know what's going to happen after tomorrow. Will it be more divided, which seems impossible, but could be, <laughs> you know, how, do, how does your book fit into this time, you think? Uh, well, there's elements of this time that this book sort of is is in some kind of conversation with. I think it's, it's, um, it feels acutely aware of the fact that there are institutions um, who are sort of concerted in their effort to, to steal all the survival. And, um, <laughs> um, and I feel like this book is aware of that. And this book is aware that, um, um, by which I mean we have a, Eight hundred billion dollar military budget. That's not good for anyone. Yeah. This book is aware of that. This book is aware that there's a kind of brutality, and when I point, I mean the people who are stealing everything up top, just sucking it from all of us. Mm-hmm. But they're good at convincing us that we ought to be at war with one another. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they are so good. They've been doing it for so long, and they're just brilliant at it, you know. And this book wants to. I think one of the things that this book is doing is like. It's not them. Like, don't pay mm-hmm. attention. Mm-hmm. I mean, we got to survive them. But well, like the gardening chapter, can't read it without thinking of climate change. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. just how it is. Totally, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. Um, again, yeah, exactly. What does an eight hundred billion dollar military budget do for climate change? <laughs> exactly, <Yeah. laughs> exactly. But that's not part of the language that we ever hear. You know, we don't ever hear when the next thing, the next appropriation 
that this is um, all kinds of brutality embedded in this. Um, and, and I feel like these questions in this book are trying to figure out, pay, trying to pay attention to witness the ways that our capacity actually to be together, to live, to love one another, are really being sort of, um, um, you know, thwarted is one way to say it, but, but ultimately I think the thing is like the, the practice of the book or the study of the book is to recognize that you're the one that I believe in. You, you know? Mm -hmm. um, it's, not, it's not a corporation who, it's never a corporation, um, or the shareholders of the government. You know, that's not who I believe in. You know, I believe in people, you know. Then every once in a while, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I have to ask you about your process, if I, if I can. Um, so how do, you, how do you make these connections? Like, do you make these connections first, or does that emerge as you write it? How does that, how does that happen? It mostly emerges as I write it. Like, I might have a question. I started that, that Pick Up Basketball essay really thinking about that book that John Edgar Wideman book. Um, but I wanted to, um, I wanted, I knew it was gonna go somewhere, but I didn't know where. Like I didn't know that it would bring my brother and my niece in. And I didn't, I wasn't surprised to end up back on that basketball court, but I was sort of surprised by where we went um, through, that, through that essay. And for the most part, I feel like my writing process is that it's sort of like something, a question that presents itself, and then I get lost. <laughs> and I start to discover what it is that I'm thinking about and what my questions are, and I keep on going, and, I, and then I come to a place, you yeah. know. Usually, I don't know if it's a resolution, um, but I come to a place, yeah. Well, you're a poet, too. How does it differ, writing poetry versus an essay? This is, for now, this is what I'm saying. And I don't know if I'm going <laughs> to... I don't know if this is right. But I... Um, I feel like my essays are are engaged with a kind of mystery that is, that is somehow just a little bit more accessible than the mystery that my poems are dealing with. And and I've been trying. This is how I feel. And then I've been trying to think. Well, what is that? How do, what does that even mean? And, and, I, and so I think. And so I think like the maybe what I mean is that built into poems, like the ways that poems work. Formally, they are um, on the page, they tend to be doing different things, you know, like white, spa white space is like a, something that a poem might use. Sound in, its, in the poem might mean more, it might make meaning itself, you know. So, which to me feels like, I wonder if, if I'm drawn to writing poems when there's a kind of question that is just a little further away, in a certain kind of way, than, than when I'm writing essays, which are still, like, I don't want to write anything that I feel like I understand or know, but I feel like um, um, maybe the question is a, it's just a little bit more articulate or, or graspable to me, something like is that. It, is this too simplistic to say a poem would be something that's more abstract for you when you write it versus an essay where you have some definite thoughts about it ahead of time, or is that just... Too yeah. reductive. Yeah, that's too reductive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, too reductive. <laughs> that's okay. I, I need to be honest is, with me. <laughs> yeah, but it is something like that, though, too. But, I mean, it's, it's, it's like, um, a, 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 I mean, I, the, the word abstract is interesting, but it's like um, further away is more, it, I mean, in a way, like, you're, you're kind of hitting it. But, but in a way, because, it, because abstract implies you can't quite touch it. Um, and it is some of that. Like I, I often use the like the auditory sense metaphor of like I can't quite hear it. Like I can't quite hear what I can't quite hear. It's that kind of thing. With essays, it feels like it's you know it's oh it's around here somewhere. But with the poems, it's like uh, not always either. But like I just finished a long a book length poem, kind of about Dr. J, and um, that took me years. And I would just feel like what what am I listening to? You know, like trying to find it. It was just so far away, but um, we'll talk in five years and then maybe okay, <laughs> I'll have yeah, a better yeah, answer yeah, on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, would your essays be more image-based versus 
sound? Like, because poetry is so mm. lyrical, poetry's yeah. music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? It's such maybe, a good maybe. question. <laughs> no, 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 it's a good question, too, because I I come to writing essays, like a, I think, like a poet. Like, I, I grind on the language, I grind on the sentences, and I, like, the sound matters a lot to me. Um, but there are things that I would probably do in a poem that I wouldn't quite do in an essay. Or I might do all the time in a poem that I, that I do only occasionally in an essay. Um, but when you said the image, it's kind of interesting. Like I, in both poems and, and essays, I'm very concerned with images, but there is a certain, well, with essays, actually I'm realizing, I'm, I'm revising a book right now, and I realize there's something about story that I'm, I always care about story, but in these essays, there's a way that I deal with story that is different than I do in poems. That's one thing. And partly, when you said image, partly I realized, oh, partly it's, I'm trying to paint these pictures in the storytelling, just like precisely, <laughs> you know? Um, well, and they are precise yeah. because you're a poet. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you've got that language that makes it precise. Yeah. Okay, so then the, what you're working on, is that another book of essays or is it It poems, is, or? it is. It's the second book of delights, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, been yeah. five years since that first one came out. Yeah. Yeah. So you're a teacher at yeah. Indi Indiana University. Is yeah. that where you teach? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Are you really popular because you give all <laughs> A's? <laughs> Everybody gets an A. <laughs> I know, I know. I wonder if they even talk about this. Even, you know, the grad students, they know by now. Like, they don't even have to think about it. Well, that's one of your incitements to joy. It's yeah. one of the sections is about, you know, school yeah. and schooling, but you go through a process of kind of talking about why a lot of education really isn't anything designed to make anybody joyful. Yeah, that's right. Right? That's and, right. But then after you got tenure, you started to free up a little bit and how <laughs> you didn't tell with your students. <laughs> totally. Totally. I just realized how miserable, well, I mean, I realized myself sort of selfishly how miserable I was when I was grading, spending all this time mm -hmm. sort of like, not only grading, but also like realizing that the, the way I graded was just by like cutting people down. That was like the rubric was, you know, the method of grading was to be like, well, if they don't do this, then you take them down this. If they don't do this, <laughs> which is just a terrible way to walk around, you know? like. And you kind of blast the workshop, which is the way a lot of writing yeah. programs work. Yeah, yeah. What um, about that? Yeah, the workshop model where, you know, someone comes in and submits their work, and then everyone kind of goes around and, like, you know, normal mode is, like, you kind of critique it. Basically, you tell them what you wish it was, and that's basically what it is. And I'm just like, that's horrible. <laughs> that's just... As opposed to like another mode of, of working on stuff, which is like, you know, we share stuff and like maybe we'll observe it. We'll just point stuff out. Mm -hmm. And then let the writer, you know, deal with it how they want to deal with it. Um, but that thing of like correcting each other's work, which really means correcting each other, not great for school. I have to ask you, okay, uh, we just met, but you know, one part of your book, you kind of deal with toxic masculinity. It's a little bit against type mm -hmm. for you. You know, I hate to talk about types, but everybody's got types, right? <laughs> I'm a type, you know, mm -hmm. and I surprise people sometimes. And yeah. you may surprise people by writing about emotion mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. you know, writing about when you were growing up mm -hmm. and being emotional and how yeah. your father reacted to that yeah, and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. What about, that was a long examination in your book. It is. It really <laughs> is. Yeah, yeah. Why is that? Well, it feels like such a good, meaningful question. You know, like, like the beginning question is like about masculinity in a certain kind of way. But that question really turns into grief, a question about grief. Um, and, but in order for me to get there, I didn't know this in writing the essay, but in order for me to get there, it was going to take a long time. And partly, I think what the, the essay is, you know, I talk about playing college football on it, and I talk about all this stuff. The coaches and, the coaches and, all this. <laughs> and yeah, they aren't they aren't exactly letting you have a lot of emotion. Right, there, right, right. Yeah, yeah. It's not like yeah. Well, there's there's kind of yeah. one emotional track that's that's right. condoned. Right. The question about like this sort of this mode of of being a man is like um, one of the things that I'm sort of wondering about is is it in fact a um, a kind of revolt or a kind of um, hanging on to or resisting maybe the fact of being a creature, you know, resisting, yeah, resisting the fact of being a creature, by which I mean something that is movable, something that is porous, you know, something that 
will die. Mm. Something that hurts, you know. And, you know, like if you play football, college football, my experience is that you mostly aren't really supposed to be a creature that hurts and is changing and yeah. is soft and is, you know, very specific moments, that's okay. Um, but for the most part, your, your objective is to be unmovable. Um, but then the essay sort of gets into thinking about, you know, my, just the sort of, you know, the depth of uh, challenge for that, for myself to be, you know, sort of like a dude who had never had the um, particular sorts of, um, uh, who had to learn in a way how to like, how to grieve, you know, how to, had to learn how to be sad, you know, <laughs> and, <laughs> and it takes me like 60 pages to, to <laughs> talk about that, it's too long. <laughs> uh, well, you write a lot about your father in that one, yeah. you know, and is that when you learned to grieve was when your father died? Or? That was the beginning of it, but I was, mm -hmm. you know, boy, I was resisting it hard. Mm -hmm. I was mm -hmm. resisting it hard. Oh, sure. Yeah, and that... That's sort of like the gift of that, the gift of that, ex you know, many gifts of that experience, actually. One of them is to sort of witness my, my terror, my actual terror at sort of being, being heartbroken, um, which I don't think is uncommon, you know? I don't mm -hmm. think that's an uncommon experience. Yeah. And to witness that and to realize the sort of lengths to which I will twist my mind up not to be heartbroken I've, wit I've seen myself, I've watched myself almost rather choose a kind of madness as opposed to rather than um, just being like, you know, devastated. Right. Um, so that feels like a real gift to be able to see that. Did you become a better writer when that happened? Oh, I think. I'm yeah, honest, you I had think. to be. I think so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because there's a kind just of softness. More honest, yeah, yeah, more honest, more softness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think so. But how'd you come yeah. up with the word insight? You know, I was kind of, we were tooling around with titles. And at one point, joy is a force that gives us meaning. A riff on the Chris Hedges book, War is a Force That Gives Us Meaning, um, was, was in there. Um, so joy is a force that gives us meaning. And I was like, nah. And then there were a couple, a couple other titles. And then I was just like, oh. <laughs> it's so funny to me because I couldn't figure it out. I was just like struggling. And the, mm -hmm. the titles that my publisher was coming up with were awful. <laughs> they were so bad. <laughs> and I was like, no, no, we can't do that. And Joy then, with a dash I, or a colon. Yeah, 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 like yeah, totally, to totally. And then my friend who has a, a little shop in this town, Frenchtown, New Jersey, like gave me a notebook and said, you know, I was like, oh, I'm going to use this notebook to figure out my title. And then I started to get it. And it was like joy a something or joy a something that, this or that. And then the word provocation came up and then the word incitement came up. And I like the word because it, I like the word for many reasons because um, like inciting joy, it's, it's the verb, the way that, that verb works is that it's sort of like, um, how do we incite joy? But it also sort of, it's, a, it's an adjective, inciting joy, you know, joy that is inciting. Um, I also like that the word sounds like insight, like an insight, you know. Um, and I also like that the word is a little bit like, huh, what is that? You know, like it's a little bit of a, <laughs> a dangerous <laughs> word or something. Um, because I feel like the kind of um, the kind of care that I'm talking about, the kind of structures of care and the structures of tending and the structures of reaching across to one another through things, um, it feels like an incitement. You know, it feels like a, um, I feel like part of the joy of the joy of witness of making this book was that I've been spending a lot of time witnessing the ways that we take care of one another, that we are we are made to do that and we do it all the time. Um, so that that feels like a lucky thing to get to write about for a little bit. And a lucky thing to read. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for being with us today to talk about this great book. Thank really you. Really enjoyed talking yeah, to you. I appreciate it. Thanks. Get your copy of Inciting Joy at Left Bank Books or at their online store. People saved these seeds because they loved these seeds, and they thought we might love them too, despite, and it's crucial we remember this, those people sometimes having just barely survived a drought or a famine or being rounded up on a forced march or put into the hold of a ship to hell. Whoever saved the seed loved us before they knew us, and some of them loved us as their world was ending. Our gardens archive that love.